All right, question 14. So we've got some box plots um, here. Well, we've got one box plot at the moment and we're gonna draw another one shortly. They display the results of a diagnostic task sat by two different classes. I guess it's two different classes over time. So if you have a look here, um, I've got, and I'll come down to the rest of this data in a second because this took me a long time to write, so I figured I will pre-write it for you and we will discuss it in a second. I'm gonna look at uh, the results of the 2020 class and then I'm gonna use them to create the box plot. Now, you need to remember, what, what does a box plot actually tell you? Well, there's uh, five important spots on a box plot. One, two, three, four, five. Um, if we go from them in order, um, you've got the lowest score down here. And if you have a look at the horizontal axis here for the marks, you can see they go from lowest to highest. So there's the lowest score. Actually, maybe going all the way to the other end, you can see that implies here's the highest score over uh, on the right-hand side. Right there in the middle, as we've seen before, this is the median. So it's not the mean or the mode, it's the middle score here, the median. And that just leaves your other two, and this is where you need to remember what we call our quartiles, right? Now the median, it breaks up your entire set of scores into two equal sections. So uh, if you had, you know, 100 students, then the score would break your top 50 and your bottom 50 uh, into two different groups. But these quartiles, we call them Q1, and Q3 because the, the median is Q2. Q1 and Q3, um, or Q1, Q2, and Q3 together, they don't break up the data into two, they break the data into four. So that's why we call them quartiles. Um, and you can sort of extend this, you know, you've got quartiles, Oops, let's not use an eraser. You've got quartiles, which break your data set into four. You've got deciles, which break your data set into 10 equal uh, chunks. And then a very common one is the percentiles, which break your data up into 100 different sections. And of course, the most common percentile that people are very familiar with is the ATAR. So uh, people's ATAR tells you, um, you know, if you got an ATAR of 75, that means you're roughly um, better than 75 or you perform better than 75% of the same cohort who did the exam with you. So we know, uh, let's just push this over to the side here. We know what these data points are supposed to be. How are we going to find them for the 2020 class? Well, because uh, all of these data points here, lowest, um, Q1, Q2, Q3, and the highest, they kind of depend on order. So we need to look at this data set here, which is kind of a mishmash of different numbers in, in random order, or maybe it's in a different order, like say alphabetical order, which is not very useful to us. And we need to put it in numerical order. And I'm gonna say ascending is probably the easiest. Now, very practically, the way that I do this is I look here and I, I don't wanna miss any of my scores. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cross off scores as I write them down in order. I look and I see what is the lowest one that I can identify. Conveniently, it's actually the 10, which is the first score there. So I'll cross out 10 to say, okay, this one's done. The next one along, again, I'm looking across the entire line. Conveniently, it's, it's also 16, so that's done. But the, uh, the next highest score is definitely not 30. There's loads of scores that are less than that. So I look and I see across on the right-hand side, it's 18. So I'm gonna write down 18, then I'm gonna cross it out. I'm gonna keep on going all the way up, and this way, I won't miss any scores, and what I'll end up with is an ordered list of all of the data points. So I'm gonna write, let's see here, the next one I can see is 20, cross that out. Oops, just going down to the next page by accident. Uh, what do we got next here? Um, 27, oh no, sorry, missed the 22 there, it's right there. Then the 27, cross that one out. Um, next one, by the looks of it, that's the first one in the 30s, cross out 30. Um, 32 is all the way on the right hand side. Uh, 33 comes up next, 34 comes up once and then it comes up twice. 35 is left over there on the left hand side and then the last number is 38. Okay, so uh, what have I got here? Well, um, for starters, um, I can already read off the first, uh, the lowest score and the highest score immediately. You can see that that's going to be 10 for the lowest and 38 for the highest. So when I go up to my new dot plot up here, I'm gonna find where 10 is. I'm gonna draw a vertical line like so. And then I'm gonna go over to 38. 
and I'm going to draw another vertical line over there. So I've got my bottom score and my top score, that's good. But now to work out all the rest of them, I need to think a little more carefully. So remembering that, firstly, um, the easiest one to find is the median because it just divides it into half. I need to know how many scores there are in total. So when I go ahead and count, it looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So if I've got 13 scores, then the middle score will be the seventh score. Let's find that on the list. Um, the seventh score, by the looks of it, is going to be 30. And you can see there, um, there's going to be six scores to the left and six scores to the right. So I've divided it into two even groups. So I'm going to find 30. Um, that's going to be on my graph here. There's 30. So there's going to be my median. I might even label that Q2 so I don't forget what it is. And then to find out my Q1, my lower quartile, and my Q3, my upper quartile, I repeat that process but for the data points that I have below. So when you have a look, you can see I've got, uh, let's highlight it in another color that I haven't used yet. Let's use pink. So this is the lowest set of scores. Gee, that's really bright, isn't it? Um, you can see right in the middle here, between 18 and 20 is 19. That's halfway in between. So 19 breaks that group into a group of three and another group of three. And then if you have a look at the data set on the right, um, it would be in between these two scores, which happen to be the same score. So 34 is going to be the uh, upper quartile. If you like, it's the median of the top half and the median of the bottom half. So now I find where those are on my uh, vertical, uh, my horizontal axis up above here. So 19 is between 18 and 20. So vertical line there. And then what do we say? 34. So here we go. All right. So I've done all five of my uh, vertical lines. That's why we call it a five number summary. Uh, Q1, Q2, and Q3, and then my minimum and my maximum. And now all I need to do is turn these um, lines into boxes and whiskers. So I'm just going to put this horizontal line in here. There's one whisker. There's the other one. And then here comes the box in the middle. It's not the neatest, but you get the idea. Okay, so I'm done. Uh, that is the box and whisker pot for 2020. And now we're supposed to use that, you can see down the bottom, to compare and contrast the two classes. Uh, now, this is really important. The question says, refer to, and then it names a few things, which if you want to get full marks on this, um, you want to identify those fairly deliberately. It says the skewness of the distributions, the measure of location, and then the measure of spread. So let's talk about each one of those in turn. So, uh, Skewness, well, um, skewness talks about which way is the data leaning. So um, I will give you an example quickly here. What does it look like if you've got a uh, sort of, you know, symmetrical data set? It's going to look like this if you were doing um, a plot of it. But on a box plot, on a box and whisker plot, you can see what it means is that your lowest and your highest are symmetrically positioned around Q1 and Q3. So that's why you can see I've written that the 2019 class has a symmetrical distribution. But if you have a look at uh, the 2020 class, there's a negative skew. Now what does that mean? Well if I go up here and again draw you an example, um, when you talk about skew, you've got positive skew, negative skew. I always remember it's a bit weird, it's a bit counterintuitive because the skew refers to which direction is the tail going in. It's not where most of your scores are, it's where most of your scores aren't. So a negative skew would be something like this. You can see um, I've got my tail pointing in the negative direction. And that's what we have here. Most of the scores here are bunched up toward the top. You can see Q2 and Q3 are quite close to that upper value there. Whereas Q1 and the lowest value over here on the right hand side, they're quite spaced out. So you can see this gap here and this gap here are very large compared to um, these gaps over here. The larger those gaps are, the more spread out the students are, which indicates there are fewer students down the negative end of the graph. So that's why I've said there's a negative skew for the 2020 class as opposed to the symmetrical distribution. So that's a point of contrast. Um, there's stronger performance for the 2020 class as compared to the 2019 class. 
I'm going to move down and now I'm going to talk about a measure of location here. So what does location mean? That's talking about where, in terms of the marks, where are my marks actually positioned? Where are the students positioned? Um, the only measures of location that we have really here are the median. You, you might use mean, um, but we haven't got that calculated here. So the median for the 2019 class is 23. And the median for the uh, 2020 class is 30. And that's way up seven whole marks. So that's why I've written it's significantly higher. Um, there's much better performance there. Then we go to measure of spread. Now you've got two different kinds of measure of spread here. You've got range and then you've got interquartile range, which is the difference between Q1 and Q3. So I've written about both. You can calculate the range by doing top value, take away bottom value, which for the 2019 class is 26. For the 2020 class, it's 28. And then you do the interquartile range, let me just write it in here for you, as Q3 take away Q1. So you can go ahead, read from the graph above. It might help you if you go and say, oh, Q1, where is that? It's gonna be 16 here. And then it is 30 over here. So 30 take away 16, you can see where I got the 14 from. You go ahead and calculate it for 2020 as well. And you get these results. Now, <coughs> excuse me. It looks to me like the range and the interquartile range are very, very similar between the two classes. So that's not a point of contrast, that's a point of comparison. So you can see here, I said the classes were consistent in the gap between the poorer results and the stronger results. So I guess from skewness and a location point of view, they're quite different, but from a spread point of view, they are quite similar. Um, now you can see I've laid out my solution in this kind of table form. Um, you could have written it in sentences uh, or even in dot points. The real key is, was your logic and was your, you know, the data points that you referred to, were they clear? Um, could we know what you were talking about on the basis of reading what you were talking, uh, what you had written in that space there?